turn please to the fifth chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah. The text that will be the focus of our attention tonight is verse 20, in which the prophet, being the mouthpiece of God, pronounces this terrible woe upon the people of Israel, particularly the men of Jerusalem and of Judah. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. I've entitled our study in this text tonight, God's Promised Judgment Upon the Perverters of Morals. And I believe this text has something to say to us that has peculiar relevance to the age in which you and I are living, to the precise condition of our own country, and therefore we need desperately to understand what it's saying and something of its application to the present hour. As we think our way through the text, first of all, I will direct your attention to what I'm calling the basic presupposition of the text. Then secondly, the tragic perversion described in the text. And thirdly, the sober pronouncement given in the text. First of all, the basic presupposition of this text. A presupposition is something you assume. You operate on the basis that it is so. Now, when God says through the prophet, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter, God is assuming something. There is a fundamental assumption, a fundamental presupposition in this text. And that supposition is this, that there is an irrevocable, unchangeable standard of good and evil. The only reason God can pronounce a woe upon the people of Jerusalem and Judah for calling evil good and good evil is that there is something, a commodity that is called good, that has always been good and ever shall be good. And there is another commodity called evil that always has been evil and ever shall be evil. If good and evil are simply whatever you make them, then God cannot indict the people for calling one the other. If it may indeed pass from one to the other, who knows, maybe the people are right. You see, the basic presupposition of this text is that there is an unchangeable, irrevocable standard of good and of evil. And what is that standard? It is mentioned in this very context in verse 24. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devoureth the stubble, and as the dry grass sinketh down into the flame, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have rejected the law of Jehovah of hosts, and have despised the word of of the Holy One of Israel. And the basic presupposition of this text is that there is a standard, unchangeable, irrevocable, inflexible, a standard of good and evil, and that standard is the law of God. Now having considered the basic presupposition, now notice the tragic perversion, or literally better word would be inversion described in the text. What have they done with this inflexible standard of right and wrong, of light and darkness, of bitter and sweet? Notice verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. That which violates the clear commandment of God, God calls evil. Now what have they done? The text does not say that they have simply neutralized it. That would be bad enough. You see, for a man to be an agnostic and say, well, I just don't know if there's anything good or evil, that's bad enough. But when men go so far as to take the thing God has called evil, and say it is not evil, 
and go beyond even making a neutral pronouncement and say, I'm not sure whether it's good or evil, but they take the very thing upon which God has pronounced the name and judgment evil, and they call it good. When vice becomes virtue, what a frightening state of inversion of moral standards. It's not mere perversion, it is inversion. They take that which God has constituted and called darkness, Darkness is always a picture when it's used with reference to moral issues. It's a picture of a turning aside from the realm of God's holiness. God is light, that is. God is spotless moral purity, and in Him is no darkness, no sin, no stain of moral evil. They take that which is the stain, that which is moral evil, and they not only neutralize it, but they say it is actually moral virtue. It is light. And I would like to suggest, and this is the heart of the burden of the message tonight, that this is the tragedy with which you and I are living in our day. As a nation, in the realms of politics, ethics, and morals, whether we're talking about them in the home, in the school, in the classroom, in the professor's chair at the college, into the very highest courts of government, We are living to behold, verse 20 of Isaiah 5, before our own eyes. A situation in which what God calls evil is being preached as good and as virtuous. Now let me demonstrate it. Let's take that inflexible standard of right and wrong, darkness and light, bitter and sweet, the holy law of God, and let's just pick out several of the commandments. This is not an exhaustive study, only suggestive so that it will, I trust, produce some independent meditation on your part. The first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This commandment says it is good that man the creature should recognize in the one true and living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator and sustainer of the universe, that the creature should recognize in that God the source of his life, the source of all that is good and glorious, and give to that God the unrivaled allegiance of his heart. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We are told in our day from educational circles, And sad to say, as in the day in which Isaiah lived, from religious circles as well, or within religious circles, no, no, this is not right. This is too narrow. It is now called an evil thing to insist that there is but one true and living God. And to talk religiously of there being but one God. The true and the living God, the God revealed in Jesus Christ. And to say that if we do not know that God, whatever we claim to know and worship is but an idol. That's too narrow. That's an evil thing. And so the pressure comes from every quarter telling us that the good described in the first commandment is in reality an evil thing. What about the fifth commandment? God says it is good that all those who are placed in a position of duly constituted authority be respected for the position they occupy. Honor thy father and thy mother. I have placed them over you. I have instituted the family and the structures of authority. And it is good that you should obey those regulations. It is right. It is sweet. It is light. But in our day, this good is being called evil. This sweetness is being called bitter. This light is being described as darkness. Many of you kids who in your neighborhood make it evident to your fellow, to the kids in your neighborhood, your buddies, your girlfriends, that you take seriously the wishes, the feelings, the sensitivities the standards, the regulations of your mom and dad, you're looked upon as some kind of a kook. We move on to the second table of the law. Thou shalt do no murder. The sanctity of life. And God has secured the sanctity of life in many ways in his word, but his law says thou shalt do no murder. 
Thou shalt not take human life except in those instances where my word says human life ought to be taken. And is it not interesting that in this day of woolly-headed so-called liberal thinking, the same people who have pushed and pushed and lobbied and promoted for the abolition of the death penalty have produced the mass murder of abortion laws both of which cheapen life. The abolition of the death penalty cheapens life. It does not sanctify life. Someone gets an itch to have a few bucks to go out and get a quick fix, a few packs of heroin, sticks his pistol in his pocket, holds up somebody, shoots him dead. No fear. Why? Human life is cheap. I can take his life and all I'll get is a lifetime, the expense of the taxpayer's in semi-confinement. It's cheapened the value of human life. And precisely the same thing has happened with reference to abortion. If there were not a text in Scripture upon which to establish the fact that at conception what is conceived is a human being, and there are texts, I'm convinced, but if there were not, it is inscribed upon the conscience of man in terms of the law of God that abortion is murder. And this is why the godless psychiatrists are admitting now that they can't handle the many women who are coming with tortured emotional lives but because they can't rid themselves of the guilt that has followed from the abortion. It's not my purpose to go into the whole subject. Perhaps that warrants a message in itself because the issue is such a burning one. But you see what's happened? We're being told it's a virtue. Why bring an unwanted child into the world? Better to kill it in the womb than kill it with a hostile environment. That sounds very virtuous, doesn't it? They call evil good. And they call good evil. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. We move to the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. God is saying it is good to maintain the sanctity of the sexual union by an arrangement in which one man cohabits with one woman within the tender self-giving relationship of marriage and any violation of that is not good. It is evil. Thou shalt not commit adultery, whether the violation be in the desire of the heart, according to Matthew 5, or the actual union of the bed. Thou shalt commit no adultery. We're being told that that good sanctity of sex is an evil thing. And furthermore, we're being told that homosexuality is not sin perversion and wickedness. Although God himself burned two whole cities primarily because of this sin. This is not evil. If that's your inclination, that's good. Society just has to catch up with this good and they're doing their best to make us all catch up to where we don't even use the term in a derisive way anymore. We don't use it in a way that would any way infer that there's anything abnormal, that there's anything bitter, anything dark, anything evil. I heard one man actually say that the worst curse upon our society is our concept of the sanctity of a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a man and woman and our whole concept of the home. If we can get rid of that, he says, we'll get rid of all our hang-ups. Good is called evil. Evil is called good. Do I need to give any further illustrations to demonstrate that this text speaks with a relevance that is shockingly pointed? Here is a description of the tragic moral perversion not only in the day of Isaiah, but in our own day. Now, what is the root of all of this? Well, look at the passage. The root of all of this is to be found in the phrase that we read earlier in verse 24. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. 
Now, the word despise most frequently in the Old Testament does not mean what we usually mean when we say it. We use despise as a word of positive and deep and a heightened sense of antipathy. I despise spinach, the kid might say. What you mean is, not that I regard it lightly, I just can't stand the stuff. Get it away from me. But more often than not, the word despised in Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, means to regard with indifference. And here's the picture. They've rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and regarded with indifference the word of the Holy One of Israel before any man, any group of men, any nation can enter the condition described in verse 20, in which good is called evil, evil is called good, darkness, light, light, darkness, bitter, sweet, sweet, bitter. There must be this twofold experience described in verse 24. There must be this rejection of the law of Jehovah and this regarding with indifference the word of the living God, the Holy One of Israel. And it doesn't take a historian to see how this was done over the past 100 years in our own life. You see, no one or very few people thought when God was ruled out of his world as creator that he would be ruled out of his world as moral governor. The smart Alex who said, well, to be with it, we've got to believe in the theories propounded and expounded and supported by Darwin, most of the people, for many good religious men, were infatuated with Darwin. They had no intention of ruling God out of his moral universe. They just wanted to push him a little bit further away from the physical universe. And when men begin to despise, to treat lightly the word of the Lord in any area, it's only a matter of time before verse 20 will be upon us. For when confidence is undermined with reference to the word of God touching the origin of things, it isn't long before confidence is undermined with reference to the meaning of things and the regulations for the things that God has made. Because until it grips me that this is God's world, made by Him for His ends, I'm His creature, accountable to Him, subject to Him, now there is a situation in which moral order is possible. But if this world just happened, and I just happened, who can tell me why I'm here, and what the rules are, why I'm here, and what will happen when I leave? Oh, you can guess, and you can surmise, but you can't tell me with any authority. But you tell me that I'm here because Almighty God made me. And the God who made me is the God who judged me. And now there's a basis for moral perspectives and for moral judgments. So there the root of this is seen in this rejection of the law of the Lord and of his word. And what came in its place? Verse 20. Verse 21, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Darkened human wisdom becomes the substitute for divine pronouncement. And what a tragedy when that happens. Having rejected the law of God, having despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, when they ask such questions, what is right? What is wrong? They have nothing but what is described in verse 20, their own wisdom. They are prudent in their own eyes. And what does God say? After that, in the wisdom of this world, the world by wisdom knew not God. Man's wisdom is folly when unenlightened by the word of truth. And so the psychiatrist and the political scientist and the sociologist and the experts and the educational leaders, they try to tell us what's good, what's right. And isn't it amazing? Yesterday's virtue is today's vice, and it may be tomorrow's virtue again. Why? Human wisdom has no fixed pole star of reference.
So in the place of God's eternal, unchangeable word forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There is the changing, vacillating opinion of man. Having considered the fundamental presupposition, the tragic perversion, now in the third place, notice the sober pronouncement in the text. The text begins with the word woe. What does the word woe mean? It's a pronouncement of great grief, of sorrow, of pain, and of misery. When someone says, woe is me, what are they saying? They're saying, I'm afflicted with grief, with sorrow, with pain, with misery. And when God pronounces woe, what he's saying is, you will have cause to cry, woe is me. Now, what is the basis of this pronouncement? The fact that saying good is evil and evil is good does not make it so. Look at verse 16 in the chapter. After mentioning the judgment upon the people that would lead them into captivity, but the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice and God the Holy One is sanctified in righteousness. What's he saying? He's saying when God brings his judgment, it will be manifest that God did not change good into evil, light into darkness. He said to you, O nation of Israel, if you follow that which is evil, you'll go into captivity by the tricks of your own perverted desires and by listening to your false prophets, you've convinced yourself that it's not so, that evil is good and good is evil. But when the grave opens itself up and multitudes of your own people go to a premature grave, and when the lowly and the high alike are humbled in judgment and captivity, then the Lord of hosts will be exalted in justice. You'll see that all of your barking about good being evil and evil being good has not changed the inflexible standard of Almighty God. That's what God is saying. The basis of this sober pronouncement is that God's character is unchangeable. God's law is unchangeable. God's knowledge is perfect. And God's patience will reach its end. Look at verse 24. The end of these descriptions of the sins of the people. Therefore, in the light of this, as the tongue of fire devoureth the stubble, and as the dry grass sinketh down in the flame, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they've rejected the law of host. And then he goes on to describe to the end of the chapter the certain judgment that will come when God's patience reaches its end. My friend... This text ought to fill you with holy dread if you're determined to go on in your sin. You can call your good evil and your evil good. You can call light darkness and darkness light, but Almighty God has not changed. And it ought to fill you with dread tonight that that God will yet make you a monument that evil is evil. When he says to you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But oh, listen. And this is what makes the gospel good news. If you're prepared this night to own your sin and say, Oh God, what you call good is good and I have not done the good and what you call evil is evil. I have not loved you. My heart's been a sink of idolatry. I've loved everything but you. I've not honored your name nor your day. I've defiled your holy law, trampled underfoot your precepts. I stand exposed and guilty. Thank God. Thank God good is always good and evil is always evil in God's sight. That's what makes the cross an inflexible standard of hope. Because upon that cross, God was dealing with his son on the basis of the inflexible standard of his law. His law said, this do and thou shalt live, this fail to do and thou shalt die. The curse of the law was upon all of the people of Christ. And the scripture says he endured that curse for us. It was the inflexibility of the law that demanded Calvary. If ever God could call evil good for a moment, Would that moment not be when his own son was bearing evil? 
If he could have called it good for a moment, there would have been no shrouding of the heavens in darkness. There would have been no agonizing cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The whole mystery of Calvary is explainable only in terms of the principle of our text. Evil is always evil and will forever be evil. That's why the only way to put it away was by the bloodletting of God's own dear son. And my dear sinner friend, that's hope for you. Because if you'll run into Christ and plead to be covered in the perfection of his sacrifice and his righteousness... God being a God whose law is inflexible cannot inflict the same punishment for the same crime twice. He bruised his son. In Christ, you will never be bruised.